You'd have to be a pretty colourless individual with no light in your eyes to think that Britain would be better without the Windrush generation. The people from the Caribbean former colonies, for the most part, of Britain, to whom we owed a debt, a debt that could never be repaid, were asked by right-wing conservative politicians, whisper it softly, principal amongst those, the then health minister, Enoch Powell, were asked to come to Britain to staff our health service and our burgeoning public transport system. We trawled the islands of the Caribbean asking people to come here. And when they did, they certainly enlivened the proceedings. They shouldered the burden of building our post-war health service and our post-war public transport and then fanned out into a myriad of different things. When I was a kid, culture in Britain was sausage, egg and chips, tea, bread and butter with your mother and father and Billy Fury on the timetable. The influx of people from the Caribbean brought with them elan, colour, dash, style, music, food. I just had jerk chicken for my lunch today, and very nice it was too. They transformed the landscape, not just in London, uh, in Birmingham and many other parts of the country. They are an indispensable part of us. So who knew then that deep in the bowels, and I say bowels advisedly, of Westminster and Whitehall, politicians were plotting to remove people from this country, to deport people from this country, some of whom had lived, worked, become parents and grandparents here for 50 years and more. And moreover, they were so ashamed of it, they were ready in Parliament to lie about the chain of command and the line of responsibility. Not that Tories were the only ones to blame. I just saw a wonderful picture from the back bench of the House of Commons on which I used to myself sit in exactly that spot. And there were three politicians there who were making speeches against changes to the immigration legislation which paved the way for the deportations of the Windrush generation. Those three politicians were Jeremy Corbyn, John MacDonald and Diane Abbott. And as Diane Abbott said, because it was her tweet I was reading, it's good to be proved right, but it would have been better if the Labour leadership at the time had joined with their three then backbench dissidents and fighting root and branch deeply racist immigration policies which have led now to a governmental crisis, the mother of all governmental crises. Amber Rudd, a real person, by the way, clinging to Parliament by 240 votes after three recounts is the person left holding the parcel now that the music has stopped. She has a right, though, to be a little bit cross that she is being demanded her resignation when, in fact, it was her predecessor that paved the way to this, who was her predecessor, Theresa May, now Prime Minister of Britain and the one who lied about the chain of command, the line of responsibility in Parliament this week. Once upon a time, as John Profumo, if he were alive, could tell you, it was a matter of honour that any minister who lied from the dispatch box could not any longer remain in the government and perhaps not in Parliament at all, as was the case with Profumo. Our ministers, including our Prime Minister, can lie with impunity, it seems, and not fall on their swords. Although there's time yet, 
because this scandal is growing exponentially under their feet. First of all, they said there had been no deportations. Then they said they did not know if there were any deportations. This is the government talking. Then they acknowledged that there had been and that they apologized for it. And then they failed to apologize properly for it, if apology means atonement in any sense. We're talking about people who were deported in handcuffs because they could not prove their right to be here. And the reason they could not prove it is that Theresa May's government, David Cameron's government, with her at the Home Office, destroyed the evidence, deliberately, willfully destroyed the evidence of their right to be here. We're talking about people being treated like criminals, people who came here as children at our urging, at our behest, people who then grew up, studied here, worked here, paid their taxes here, had children here, who then had children here, and grandmothers and grandfathers being deported, being turned back at airports when returning from holidays, being subject to bills of tens, maybe scores of thousands of pounds for NHS treatment that they had had or were waiting for. And it was being claimed they had no right to that treatment. It is a shameful story. A shameful story to Commonwealth citizens unfolding under the eyes of the Commonwealth leaders assembled in London right now, I know, because I couldn't get down Park Lane for fully 30 minutes as they came and went to their hotel headquarters. The Commonwealth leaders are here. The Queen asked them to allow Prince Charles to be the next leader of the Commonwealth. How much we love them. Their flags festoon the public boulevards in London this week. Yet we have treated our Caribbean Commonwealth citizens in a shameful way, and I accentuate the word shame full way. Now, I'm a big supporter of the Commonwealth. Why? Because it used to be the empire. It used to be the place that we conquered, killed people, stole their people as slaves, and then looted every piece of wealth that we could carry and mined and dug from the ground that which was theirs. I look at the crown jewels and I see all the thefts from the Commonwealth. I look in the V&A I look in the British Museum and I see all the treasures that we stole from them. And all they're asking in return is a job on the buses and not to be deported when they become grandparents. Can you think of anything more shameful than that? Can you think of an immigration system more shameful than one in which the entirety of the overwhelmingly white European Union has full rights to come here, set up home and live and work here, whilst the people who speak our language, who stood by us in our hours of need, who came here at our request to fulfill vital public service roles, are actually being deported. And if this story had not broken onto the public consciousness, in the way that it has, they would all quietly have been deported. As most of you know, I'm not a supporter of the so-called free movement rules in the European Union. I recognize that we will need immigration. I'm a Commonwealth first man myself. If we need immigration, it should be coming from Jamaica, Australia, from Canada, from India from all the parts of the world that we like to pretend are a part of our family, except when it comes to deporting our elderly family 
members. And we'll be talking about Salisbury. The Scripples were quite fortunate, you know, to have escaped all these hot spots that are now being identified in Salisbury. We are now told that it was not brought by Yulia in her luggage through Moscow Airport, through London Heathrow, and all the way to Salisbury. Neither was it, as we were told quite definitively, powder that was put into the air vents of Mr. Scripple's car. We're now told that it was nothing to do with an Italian restaurant in Salisbury. I won't name it. I don't want to make its long-term prospects any worse. Even though we burned the table at which they had sat, burned it, just for the preservation of evidence, you know, we're now told that it was not a gel. We're now told it was a liquid. A liquid poured on a door handle? What kind of delivery system is that? If you pour a liquid onto a door handle, won't 99% of it be lost on the ground? Has any been found on the ground? And if it was a liquid, military-grade nerve agent delivered on a door handle, how come hundreds of millions of pounds are now about to be spent fumigating, cleansing deeply, practically everywhere in the centre of Salisbury? And I repeat this question I've asked here many times. Where did our heroic police officer, Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, get infected? Was it at the house or was it at the park? I'm asking again, again for the tenth time here. Who are the people of Salisbury supposed to be looking out for? If there are assassins at large with deadly nerve agent weapons, who are the people of Salisbury and the people of all of Britain supposed to be looking out for? Is it a man? Is it men? Is it a woman? Is it women? Is it a tall man? A small man? A fat man? A thin man? A blonde man? A red-headed man? A white man, a black man. Who are we looking for? Why is there no manhunt for an assassin that has caused such mayhem and damage in one of our cities? I ask again, why in the most militarized county in England? Hear that again the most militarised county in England, are there no CCTV pictures of anyone of interest in the investigation of this crime? Why is there no identical drawing? These are questions which journalists should be asking, but are not asking, preferring instead to swallow hook, line and sinker, whichever successive and contradictory cockamamie state theory that is dished out to them without a blush, without breaking step, without even a hint of embarrassment that what they're telling you now is utterly contradictory to what they last told you but with equal vehemence. And I coined what I've called the Galloway Doctrine. It is the primary responsibility of every parliamentarian and every journalist to question that which the state is telling them, to point out inconsistencies, not to mention to ask this most basic of all questions. If the Scripples were attacked by a military-grade nerve agent called Novichok, brackets, or related substance, 
close brackets, of such purity that only a state actor could have produced it, how come the only dead beings in Salisbury are a pedigree cat and two guinea pigs? <laughs> <laughs>